expecting uh, Narendra Modi to arrive in the next 10 minutes or thereabouts. Uh, there would have been a time a visit to the UK by Mr Modi would, be not, would have been unthinkable. He was a pariah 10 years ago. He was, in fact, because he was accused of presiding over a massacre of around 1,000 Muslims in his state of Gujarat. And though different courts have said that they haven't found enough evidence, but majority of people in India, around 70% of population who didn't vote for his party, still believe that if he wasn't directly responsible, at least he presided over and he failed to act against those who killed Muslims in Gujarat in 2002. So UK and US, US have denied him visa explicitly. He was unwelcome in, in, in Europe. But since he has got electoral mandate, it seems various governments forgetting human rights are willing to invite him. Yeah. He's never expressed any regret, has he, about the, the riots which led to, what, was it more than a thousand deaths? More than 1,000 deaths, but in fact, not only has not experienced uh, regret, he has also been quite, uh, in, in his bravado, he has talked of how he's Hindu nationalist. Now, in recent times also, since he has become Prime Minister, Muslims have been killed on the accusation that they've eaten beef, and mind you, in India, it's not illegal to eat beef. A number of secularists and atheists have been killed by right-wing organizations, and Modi has not opened his mouth once, except he keeps talking of development, but he never... Uh, sort of argues against his own political party and those who back him by saying that people should move beyond divisive politics. The problem he faces is he's a divisive figure and not a unifying figure and India at this point needed a unifying figure. Yeah, he may not necessarily be a unifying figure in your view, but he's a, he's a powerful figure, I mean, for obvious reasons, but also just as an orator, I mean, if we, we'll see in his speeches, won't we, a man absolutely the top of his game politically. He is, but let's keep in mind that we had a bigger orator in Europe, that was Hitler in 1930s, yeah. right? He was also popular amongst many Germans. We have Erdogan today who wins up to approximately 50% of vote, but is he necessarily a democratic figure? I don't think so. See, there's a difference between getting electoral mandate, which is getting a political majority, and being liked or at least being appreciated and respected by majority people. Modi, with all his bravado and his speech and everything, has not got more than 31% of vote in any election. The problem he faces is that a number of secularists, and that's majority of Indians, secularists, Muslims, and also marginalized caste in India don't trust him because he's very close to a paramilitary organization called RSS, and he always takes pride in saying that he's part of that organization. Okay, but we ought to stress, I mean, you know, you, you make a, uh, the, the simile you draw with, with Adolf Hitler is an is a inflammatory one, isn't it? Let's face it, tens of thousands of people will pack Wembley Stadium to welcome him. So, for, for those people who do revere him, uh, it's offensive to, to liken him to a fascist leader. Let's not take that any further. Let's simply reflect on the fact that... Mining the diaspora, that's what he's been, the, the suggestion has been before. He's been to various countries, he's been to America, he's been to Australia, other places where there is an Indian diaspora, and connecting with them in a very visible way, and we will see that in the next few days. We will see that, but we'll also see for the first time in UK phones that when an Indian Prime Minister comes, you not only have those who are, let's say, admirers of him, but also the critics. For the first time, you'll find not only Kashmiris who are occupied and whose human rights abused and who, whose human rights have taken away in India, them protesting, not only Sikhs who had been killed in 1980s, but for the first time, you'll find secular Indians, and that includes majority of Indians, also protesting against him. But I'm not being inflammatory when I talk of, compared with Hitler. Please keep in mind that in 1930s, Hitler was very popular in Germany. So we have to distinguish between what's popular and what's democratic. Take example of Putin. Putin is quite popular in Russia, but does that make him necessarily a democratic leader? I don't think so. How do we think, obviously we don't know for sure, but how, how do we feel um, Mr. Modi feels about the UK? I mean, there, there is a degree of wishful thinking on the part, you could argue, of some business leaders in the UK and politicians too, that the old links matter. Uh, experience suggests they don't necessarily. They don't. You see, even with the UK, you have to notice that policies have changed, at least in some, well, not subtle, many very uh, blatant manner. In last one month itself, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, has hosted not only Modi, but also Al-Sisi, we know his record in uh, Egypt, and has hosted the biggest authoritarian leader possible in the, in the world today, that's Chinese President Xi Jinping. So, in a sense, UK is going out of way to say that human rights doesn't matter. What matters is big business. And Modi, indeed, will bring big, big, big business here. Now, UK for him is an interesting phenomenon because he has a large, he has significant support amongst the diaspora here. But please keep in mind that the diaspora in the UK is not reflective of majority in India. Majority people in India are suppressed caste under the particular caste system in India. But majority of diaspora in the UK belong to the state from which Modi comes.